now we're going to be talking about optimizing fungal PCR. And this is fungal PCR in the sense of actually detecting um, fungal disease directly from a, a specimen. And mostly this, this, this will focus on the Aspergillus PCR because that's where most of the work has been done. But if I have time, I'll try and just say a couple of things about Candida PCR and Pneumocystis PCR. So we need fungal PCRs because gold standard is microscopy in culture and we know that that's slow and not always as sensitive as it could be. It needs tissue that contain viable fungi, um, which we don't always have. Um, some fungi like pneumocystis we can't culture anyway. Um, fungal identification um, from a culture that we could grow requires a lot of expertise that may not be there. Now, the advantage of PC, fungal PCR is we can use peripheral specimens um, and not necessarily uh, an invasive tissue uh, biopsy. And we can perform preemptive surveillance in high risk patients, which potentially could lead to earlier diagnosis and better management, maybe improved outcomes. So, when we're designing a fungal PCR, um, it will depend on what we actually want to use it for, whether it's preemptive surveillance um, for a particular disease in high risk patients, or whether it's just getting a definitive diagnosis of fungal disease when it's very clear that there is a fungal disease there. So the way that we want to design the assay will uh, determine our choice of specimen that we're going to test and how often we're going to test and how we're going to interpret the results. We can design the assays to be real-time or quantitative. There's very old-fashioned methods which you could still use if you wanted to, like nested PCR and gel-based PCRs, but they're probably suboptimal compared to the more modern methods we have available. We can be genus or species specific, and we can design our assays to detect specific mutations if we wanted to. The gene target would ideally be um, multi-copy to maximize our sensitivity and it needs to be sufficiently conserved to allow amplification of the target um, group of fungi that we're, we, we want to detect. Uh, but there needs to be enough sequence variation there to define it, to separate it from, um, from other fungi. Okay. Now, Aspergillus PCR has been around for a long time um, and until recently was considered to be quite experimental. And, um, you know, with many, many, many studies in the literature um, that were all quite variable in their design and uh, the, the populations that they were studying, um, there was a lot of variability in the sensitivity and the specificity um, and the clinical utility. So. It hasn't been included in the EORTC MSG case definitions um, so far. Um, in the 2002 first edition of the uh, definitions, it was omitted because of the potential for false positives and because of a lack of a standardized and commercial platform. And in the second revision in 2008, it was omitted because there was no standard for the methodology and that um, uh, clinical validation was absent. But uh, since then, there have been significant efforts through an ISHAM group um, to overcome these issues and get Aspergillus PCR optimized and to a point where it could be um, incorporated into the EORTC criteria. So the European Aspergillus PCR Initiative, EAPCRI, was formed in 2006 with the main goal to develop an Aspergillus PCR standard so that it could be incorporated into the third edition, which might be available next year, perhaps. So they started by actually looking at the methods that people were using um, and evaluating um, the strengths and the weaknesses of those methods. So they they did this as two studies. One was based on whole blood specimens and the, the second one was based on serum specimens. So they set up a, a quality controlled panel of specimens 
um, spiked with Aspergillus canidia uh, in whole blood and serum and distributed those to um, 24 laboratories around the world who tested those specimens and reported back whether or not they detected Aspergillus. And, um, and then they provided details of their pr protocol. Um, and so the protocols were then scrutinized on the basis of their results to determine which aspects of their protocols were really important and valuable uh, and which were actually um, confounding the results, which was um, preventing accuracy in the results. So the protocol steps they looked at were the volume of the specimen that was being used. For whole blood, whether they were lysing red cells and white cells, how they were lysing fungal cells, whether it was through a mechanical breakdown of the fungal cell wall or through a chemical lysis, their method for DNA purification, uh, the volume that they were eluting their extracted DNA in, whether or not they were using internal controls, the number of replicates they were using, the PCR platform and format, and their DNA target. So all of those steps were looked at and they decided which of these steps was useful and which um, were not useful. What they found uh, it, in the broadest way possible is that the performance of Aspergillus PCR is not influenced so much by the design of the PCR assay, but by the DNA extraction. And if you think about it, there's actually very little Aspergillus DNA circulating. Um, and if you want to be able to detect it, you need to be able to detect very tiny amounts of Aspergillus DNA. So having a, a very, very efficient DNA extraction method that could um, capture every last little bit of Aspergillus DNA that was there and make it available for the PCR is the, the best way to have a successful assay. So they then made recommendations for DNA extractions. So for whole blood, they needed you to start with a, um, a volume of specimen that was three mils or more, which is quite a lot, actually, if you're working with it in the lab. And it had to be anticoagulated with EDTA only, no other, no heparin, no other um, anticoagulators. Um, Red cell and white cell lysis steps were absolutely necessary because the fungal DNA does get associated with them. Uh, for the fungal cells, bead beating, a really mechanical bashing of the fungal cell wall uh, is required. S uh, chemical lysis is just not going to uh, be sufficient. It has to incorporate a non-human DNA internal control to make sure that there's no uh, inhibition uh, the elution volume of the DNA has to be less than 100 microliters, and that's what's required to sufficiently concentrate the DNA. You have to duplicate your samples, use a real-time PCR platform, a multi-copy target, and either a genus or species-specific probe, and incorporate negative controls, which is obvious. For serum, it's a bit different. For serum, we can have as little as 0.5 mils to start with, ideally more, but as little as 0.5. And we can use commercial DNA extraction platforms. Um, although if we're going to do that, we need to make sure we screen all of the kit reagents beforehand and make sure there's no fungal contamination in there, which would give us some false positives. And it does happen. Um, you can buy kits that are com completely contaminated with fungus before you even start. Um, Again, incorporate non-human DNA controls, elution volume of less than 100 microliters, duplicate samples, all the same sorts of recommendations as we just heard about for whole blood. Uh, they do point out though for serum that a PCR positivity of 43 cycles provides the best diagnostic accuracy. So serum seem to be a more attractive specimen to work with. It's a lot easier to handle in the lab. It's a lot, um, you can use smaller volumes and suddenly you can use smaller tubes in smaller centrifuges um, and it's faster. So serum was a more attractive method. They then actually compared serum to plasma um, in a trial uh, to see if there was any 
very difference between them. Um, so they took PED, plasma and serum samples from haematology patients, 19 of which were proven or, or probable invasive aspergillosis and 42 controls and screened them uh, over a period of time and found that plasma had a much higher sensitivity than serum at 90, nearly 95% compared to 68%. Plasma had a much higher specificity than serum at 83% uh, compared to 76%. The time to positivity for plasma was 16 or nearly 17 days before diagnosis by traditional methods, whereas it was only 10.8 uh, days before uh, diagnosis by traditional methods for serum. Both still getting both still being positive before um, before diagnosis, but plasma seems to be that much earlier. And plasma was the earliest indicator of infection in uh, 13 cases as compared to six cases for serum. So plasma seems to be um, uh, the best method for sensitivity and specificity and also handling in the laboratory. So plasma seems to be the best method to work with best specimen to work with. Having worked out which specimens we should be working with and, uh, and how we need to be doing our DNA extractions, the EA PCRI then looked at actually the PCR assay, PCR assays themselves and which factors were most important in dictating specificity and sensitivity, how, which were the most accurate methods. So in order to do this, they pre prepared fungal, gen fungal genomic DNA panels and distributed them to laboratories to test. So these panels contained uh, six different aspergillus species at high concentration and low concentration and a range of non-aspergillus species as well. So these got sent out and labs tested them and uh, reported back with which samples were positive and which were negative. So overall, um, Aspergillus fumigatus tested positive more than any other Aspergillus species. Um, and of the false negatives, Aspergillus lentulus was most often negative, um, followed by Aspergillus versicola, terius, Flavus and Niger. Uh, there were there was a po false positive rate of about just under fifteen percent, and most commonly it was Penicillium and Fusarium DNA that was causing the false positives. So they looked at uh, the technical factors of the assays themselves to determine which were associated with accuracy and which were not. So they found that the PCR target was important in dictating the accuracy and um, the ribosomal RNA genes were either 18S or 28S were had an accuracy of about 72% compared to only 56% for other genes. Genus specific assays were more uh, accurate than species specific assays. Um, but the payoff for that is that genus specific assays were more commonly associated with false positives. The sensitivity um, was uh, better for um, ribosomal <coughs> RNA genes as compared to other genes. Uh, it was better with genus specific assays and it was better with a larger reaction volume. They found no significant association between the accuracy and the PCR platform that was used, the DNA template volume that was used, or the final reaction volume. So the bottom line there is that the, we should be using 18S or 28S as our target gene, and we should be designing genus-specific assays. There are a few commercial assays available now. Mike assay, uh, which is validated for BAL and serum, it's a closed tube method, so it could eliminate some false positives and it incorporates the internal controls that we need. You could get a result in as little as three hours, but in all likelihood it's going to take several days because labs have to batch things. And its performance is comparable to um, PCR and uh, to in-house PCR assays and galactamanin. Mm -hmm. 
There's another test called Aspergenius, which is validated for BAL. And this test um, has species-specific probes for Fumigatus and Terius, so it could tell you what species it is in those two cases. But if it doesn't detect those species, it does have a genus-specific probe. So if you, you might interpret that as having an, another species if you only had a positive from the Aspergillus species probe. It's got an internal control as well. The other thing about this assay is that it has um, probes that can detect the four of the common mutations that confer multi-azole resistance in Aspergillus fumigatus. And this was validated on uh, BAL specimens in the Netherlands where this multi-azole resistance is most uh, predominant. There is uh, a lot of evidence now for the clinical use of Aspergillus PCR. So it's comparable to galactaman and ambetadiglucan assays. It has the potential to determine genus and species and azole resistance. There are external quality assurance programs available and you should be participating in one if you're doing this test. There is a standard now available for DNA extractions. There are commercial PCRs available. There's even a standardized Aspergillus uh, DNA calibrator so we can do qPCR. There are numerous publications demonstrating its clinical utility. And for all of these reasons, it's now highly likely that Aspergillus PCR will be in the third revision of the EORTC MSG criteria. Do I have a few more minutes? <laughs> what? Yes? One minute. So <laughs> uh, there's Candida PCR and Pneumocystis PCR that have, still have a long way to go. Um, there are some recommendations for Candida PCRs now. Um, so whole blood seems to perform better than serum. Um, ribosomal RNA or P450 genes seem to work better than other targets. And uh, a low detection limit seems to be better. Uh, a systematic review and meta-analysis showed that the PCR performed better than blood cultures in diagnosis of uh, invasive candidiasis and provided an earlier diagnosis, although the ultimate effect, ultimate effect on the clinical outcome really needs a, a trial. Uh, there are also some recommendations available for pneumocystis PCR. Um, uh, BAL is recommended, or if not, induced sputum. Real-time PCR should be used. Um, Closed tube quantitative PCR has better sensitivity and specificity than non-quantitative PCR. Uh, probes are preferable to intercalating dyes. Um, yes, that's the, that's the pertinent details. There's still probably a long way to go in developing the pneumocystis PCR standard, but uh, the evidence so far suggests that the commercial versions of this test are not necessarily superior to in-house assays though. Okay, so uh, there's, there's a lot of work been made on, uh, uh, done on developing the Aspergillus PCR. Uh, make sure you get your DNA extraction method right, otherwise it doesn't matter how good your PCR assay is, it's not going to work. Ribosomal RNA gene targets and genus-specific assays seem to be the way to go for superior performance. Thank you.